All right, well, we're going to go ahead. We're going to get started now. Uh, this is the, the last panel. I think it's an exciting panel. I'm coming from a company that provides uh, technology, service, information to the people on, on this panel, so I'm personally very interested in this conversation. But uh, just to make this a little bit more interactive, uh, it's going to be a little bit different from what you've experienced before. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is ask the people in the room, how many people here are coming uh, from legal tech startups or legal technology providers? Just show of hands. Okay. Excellent. And how many people in the room are coming from, are, are practicing attorneys either at a law firm or a corporate legal department? Show of hands. Great. Excellent. Uh, be, and the reason I'm asking the question is, we have here uh, on the panel pioneers and, and leaders on um, both the legal operation side of things and information management at, le at legal at law firms and legal departments. And these are the people that a lot of the legal tech providers would think about when you're thinking about your forward-thinking customers and how they would adopt and implement some of the technologies and offerings that you are providing. So what I'm going to do uh, is make this a more interactive session. If you have questions, come up to the mics and, and do that. I have questions of my own that I'm excited and, will, and looking forward to getting some responses on. But uh, I would like uh, the people in the room and the, the audience uh, to raise those questions and take advantage of the people we have here. So. Mary, uh, we'll, we're going to go down the line here, and uh, if you can please just introduce yourself. Some of the, um, and I think I think most importantly, and and to touch a little bit about on customer empathy and create that feel, feeling of understanding of where you're coming from. If you can describe where you sit in the organization, your legal department, your law firm, and the stakeholders that you uh, have to deal with. Sure. Uh, Mary O'Carroll, I've been with Google for nine years as the head of legal operations, technology, and strategy. My role encompasses uh, three major parts. The first is financial management and vendor management, so working with our law firms and our budgets and making sure that we're getting uh, good value for the dollar we're spending externally. The second area we focus on is implementing systems and tools and knowledge management, so helping make things internally more efficient as well. And then last but not least, we've hired a bunch of former consultants and we have an arm that is focused on uh, balancing speed, quality, and cost of services delivered and we do a lot of process improvement in-house. Um, our department is almost a thousand people worldwide in countless practice areas and products. So those are, are my clients um, and my team is about 15. Thank you, Mary. And Mike, are you... Uh Describe a little bit of where you're coming from. Sure, yeah. I, uh, Mike Lucas, I am uh, the CIO at Wilson Sonsini, uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the firm in a minute. I have been a CIO for a number of years and have been in legal technology for about 20 years. Uh, and before that, I, I was in oil and gas, and I was also in engineering. Um, so, I, so I've lived tech uh, for really my, my whole career, and uh, I, I joined Wilson Sonsini in October, so I'm new to this area, new to California, what a wonderful place to be. Uh, but certainly Wilson Sonsini uh, is uh, an, an excellent, excellent firm, and uh, I'm, I'm really, really uh, happy to be here. I'm really surprised that there aren't many CIOs here. Uh, I think they're truly missing out on a, on a fantastic opportunity. Uh, I have heard so many amazing stories today and, and have met so many uh, really great people. So certainly really, really happy to be here and looking forward to sort of furthering our conversation. Thank you, Mike. And Lucy? Hi, I'm Lucy Bosley. I'm at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft about, now that you're all listening, 12 years, uh, 12 plus. And I started as a regular attorney, transactional attorney. Uh, love doing contracts, did a whole bunch of contracts. Once I became labeled as a unicorn because I love process and efficiency and automation, I uh, moved into legal operations and contracting. I oversee four key areas. Um, I had to write it down so I don't forget, but uh, spend management, uh, records management, uh, contract management, and then all of our shared systems and services and kind of technology support. 
Another fun part of my day job is everything I learn in my day-to-day -day support of legal work and, and being efficient for our legal department. We are also now translating it to an external focus and working with uh, LSC and pro bono net on really trying to expand access to justice and how we can contribute technology there. So a fun combination. Similar problems in providing legal services to a whole lot of people with a very broad spectrum of legal knowledge or lack thereof. So trying to apply skills in both areas. Thank you so much, Lucy. So here's a question for all, all three of you, um, but we'll start with Mary. Um, I mean, all three of you are part of innovative ecosystems. You come from innovative companies. You deal with innovative clients in the case of, of, of your law firm, uh, Michael. But, but how, you know, but, but it's still the legal profession and, and your practice is, tends to be on the more traditional side of, these, uh, of the ecosystem. How do you leverage the innovation that is occurring in, in the ecosystems and in order to be an innovative function or within, within the, your environment? I think I'm very lucky to be working at a company that embraces innovation and trying new things. We have an engineering culture, so we don't think of things as failure. We think of launching and iterate. Get something out there, try a whole bunch of things, see what sticks, learn from that, adapt. Um, it, it is challenging. We're still working with lawyers, so despite the fact that we're a technology company, that change management continues to be the hardest part of our jobs. Um, but, but we get there you know, slowly but surely. I think for us, um, it has to be better than the current process. So we never implement technology just for the sake of implementing technology. It's usually the, the result of a, a project where we're looking at people and processes and how can we do things better. And if technology becomes a component of, of the result of how to make things more efficient, then we look at you know, how we can leverage technologies. Um, and it's really important for us to have that end result to be easier, better, faster, uh, for the attorneys who are doing their day-to-day -day jobs, because otherwise, if there's an extra click or an extra step, it's, it's not going to get adopted. Uh, Mike? Yeah, so, so Wilson Sonsini, uh, I'll I give you a little bit of context, is, uh, is a law firm here in Palo Alto. They were, we actually have 15 offices um, and uh, about 800 lawyers. Uh, I, have a, I have a group of about 100 people that work, uh, work in the, in, under the CIO, and, and we, we manage everything from sort of core infrastructure, uh, technology, uh, all, all of really what, what kind of encompasses technology in the firm, as well as reach th research services, records, uh, and, and uh, e-discovery. So, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, a day in the life for me as a CIO for Wilson Sonsini, recognize uh, about they have about three or 4,000 clients. Uh, most are in the, the tech space or the life sciences space. So we have a ton of technology clients. Uh, so you can imagine as a CIO of Wilson Sassini, I get a lot of uh, sort of pings on almost a, a daily basis. Hey, would you mind uh, taking a look at this product? You know, I have, we have a client who's in this space. They'd like to talk with you for a few minutes. Um, I get a whole lot of that. Uh, and, and it's actually, you know, it's, it's a blessing in a lot of respects because it, it gives me an opportunity at a very early stage to engage with, you know, emerging tech. I mean, what a great opportunity. I mean, if you're a, a law firm CIO, that's as good as it gets. And, you know, it also, it, it gives us an opportunity to, to help influence the direction of products sometimes because early tech providers are looking for feedback. They're looking for input. And, and uh, you know, I, I enjoy providing that and, of course, learning about technology. But, you know, I'm tasked with trying to improve the efficiency of the law firm. Uh, and, and that's something that's really, really hard to do. And so I, I kind of wanted to, to, to let you guys know, you know, as, as, as you know, service providers that are, that are trying to kind of, you know, get our business, my business, the firm's business, um, wh what kinds of things that go through my mind as you're talking about your technology? And I'm interested in knowing whether it fits into a roadmap, you know, that we have in the firm. What I'm trying to do overall with regard to enterprise systems, whether that be innovation, uh, you know, practice technologies, things around pricing and, and, and project management, uh, tools for due diligence, tools for, for early case discovery, all those kinds of things. And, you know, so, so think about, I have to integrate all of those tools. So think about interoperability. Um, think about how this, the, you know, how hard is it going to be if, uh, if I purchase the product and we, we sort of move forward. When you're thinking about proof of concept and trying to say, hey, I just want to do a POC, just take a look at this product. 
Here's my challenges, right? I could like the product. I think it's a really good service that the firm would really, really benefit from, and I can articulate that to various stakeholders in the firm. And, and, and they'll get engaged, and they'll say they want to see it, and they'll see it, and they'll be kind of interested, and they'll get a little bit excited. Um, and then I'll go, okay, we're going we're gonna to have a pilot, and, and we'll do some testing. And, the, and that's when the sort of lawyer involvement sort of drops off. Uh, people just sort of are busy, their heads are down, I don't really get a really good feel for whether or not this is helping them. Um, and so here I am trying to make a decision for the firm with really limited information. Um, and that's where a lot of sort of pilots and proof of concept sort of die on the vine. Um, so, you know, my job is to try to really recognize these and promote these. And, and the way I try to do it is really with a lot of outreach within the firm. So trying to consistently talk to people, understand what's top of mind for them, what we're trying to solve, and, and you know, encourage them to take the time uh, to really do some hard analysis uh, because there's so much opportunity in law firms for efficiency today. Um, we've come a long way in a lot of areas around KM. We have a really excellent KM program. Uh, we, we, we certainly are doing really well on the contract side. Uh, we, we've got some good success story, stories. Uh, we were doing due diligence around contracts years and years ago. Um, but at the end of the day, there's still much more that we can do uh, to help with, with drive profitability, to really truly get some you know, analytics around how we're doing, to be able to deconstruct how we're delivering our service to our clients. Uh, there's certainly, there's just a, a, a plethora of opportunity uh, and so, you know, that, my job is sort of balancing all of that, but just recognize it's not a, necessarily an easy thing to do as a CIO as, a, as I look at emerging tech. Um, the other thing I'll mention, and, and I'll, I'll let others talk here, is uh, around funding. Um, you know, some firms that, you know, you certainly have heard in the press, the Dentons of the world and others have, you know, come up with a, a more official program for innovation and funding for innovation. Uh, and, and that's, you know, many other firms have it, and we sort of catch as catch can. But it's difficult when you go into a budget season to, to earmark funds for innovation um, because there's so, many, there's so much pressure on expenses in law firms today. You know, you, we've heard all about earlier today about the flat market. Um, and so, you know, it, it's sort of a balancing act for me to try to carve out funding and sort of sneak funding away for looking at products uh, that are emerging. The landscape's changing very quickly. I'm amazed at how much is out there today. Uh, and, and so much of it could, could help. But, you know, we we're, we're sort of have to pick and choose because there's, there's not a lot of, of truly earmarked R&D funding in law firms. It's changing a little bit, and, and certainly we try to kind of carve some, some funding out. But those are some of the, you know, just the brushstroke of some of the challenges of CIO uh, that, that I face. And Lucy, if I may just add uh, a twist to the question, sure. right? So first, you know, how do you leverage uh, Microsoft's resources and innovation uh, um, mandate? And I guess the other one is, can you talk about a, a, an example of how you've transformed a process internally in, in, in your organization and just innovated there? Sure, absolutely. So to touch on kind of the, you know, the, the first part of how are we doing with, with, with innovation and how, how are we successful in our conversations with our own attorneys? And I would say we kind of have two, two, two buckets. Um, we have a very large bucket, and I'm gonna use an analogy of those who are really good at riding a tricycle or maybe a bicycle with training wheels, and they're really good at it, and they've been doing that, and it's safe, and it's comfortable, and that's wonderful, and it really works for them. And then we've got a little bucket of people who are ready to launch a rocket, and we are ready to go. And we're looking at each other going, let's go! Let's go fire up our rocket and our and tricycles and, and rockets. <laughs> now, what's nice is we're supported by our leadership to do both. So my job is to help the bicycle riders get their wheels off. And I can give them a few examples. And I put in some guardrails so they don't fall off. That's part of my day job. The other part of my day job is to fire up a rocket here and there. And so that's been really cool. Where we've gotten to fire up a rocket, it is a slow-moving rocket. It's taken almost a decade to get where we are. But by all accounts, a rocket, if you ask all the bicycle riders around me, for sure. Um, I think in the contracting space, and I don't want to talk about contract uh, you know, automation necessarily. I don't want to talk immediately about CLMs. I mean, that's 
That's great, there's enough talk about that. What I wanna talk about is what we've done in a whole realm of innovation of people, process, and tools, right? The tools come last for me. We really did a overhaul of how we support our kind of non-revenue contracts is the easiest way to explain it because touching revenue contracts was super scary 10 years ago, so I was allowed to tinker with the procurement contracts. They were perceived as low, lower risk, um, a ton of volume. So basically, as my regular day job as a lawyer, we had to do a whole bunch of contracts, and I had to do them fast, because that's all what the business cares about. Kind of rule number one to outside counsel out there. All our business cares about is speed. Our job in-house is to make sure there's quality, but all they care about is speed, and if you're charging me by the hour, I'm gonna lose out, and they're gonna be mad at me, right? So that's the dilemma we're all in. So where we've been able to launch a bit of a rocket is we have outsourced 20,000 contracts a year to an alternative legal service provider across three different geographies and 14, 15, 13 languages. Picatinny keeps changing. Um, we have uh, engaged in a pretty, pretty, I think, um, innovative engagement with law firm where we treat them as a managed service. They deliver to us like an alternative legal service provider based on data and metrics and volumes and SLAs and KPIs and all those good words that usually we don't use in law. And then we've also automated. So we have the right combination of a optimized process where we're tracking and we're using data and we've automated and we use templates and we use smart resourcing and outsourcing combinations. So I think our, our contracting space has probably been one of our more uh, more successful, innovative, kind of holistic view of innovation, not just automation. And uh, uh, Mary, a similar question. So as part of CLOCK, where, where you're, uh, by the way, it's a, a very innovative organization for folks that um, haven't heard about it. It's, it's a, it's a, a um, you can speak more about it, but it's a, it's a um, consortium of legal professional, legal operations professionals, and this is a, a new thing. I think, I think legal operations professionals, I used to be one at some point, um, <laughs> are starting to be more professional, share best practices, create an industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the best practices, most innovative approaches and, and uh, processes that um, you've either implemented at Google or have colleagues done? Sure, so, so I'll, I'll back actually back up a little bit. So prior to joining Google, my background was investment banking and consulting. So I approached the legal industry with a financial analysis and process improvement eye. Um, I, I joined Oric, and I was there for, for many years working on profitability, and we did really cool things there with data analyses and dashboards and profitability analysis. And then I got to Google, and I kind of figured it'd be the same thing, just going in-house and managing you know, a mini law firm at a company. Um, and my first week there, my GC said to me, the most important thing for, for you is to help me understand if I'm getting value out of the money that I'm spending with outside counsel. I said, okay, I'm on it. I went and met with all his leads. Um, I met with our head of litigation and I sat down with her and I said, can you just tell me what systems and tools you're using to, to manage outside counsel, who's working on what? And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I was like, okay, maybe you don't have software. Do you have a spreadsheet? Can I just see like where you're managing your data? She's like, data, I don't understand. I go, how do you know who's working on what? She goes, oh, I have these post-its. I was like, oh my God. Do we have any tools here? I mean, we're, we're Google, like one of the best technology companies in the world. And we had nothing. We had no IT support. We had no technology. We had no matter management. We had no budgets even. I mean, it was, it was pretty dismal. Um, so then I spent the next few years trying to put together all the people and processes in place to, to make sure that I would be able to answer that, that question that the GC asked me the first day of my work. We put in an e-billing system, we put in guidelines and engagement letters about how I wanted our firms to work with us. I defined the structure of the way we wanted the data to come in, what a matter looked like, how we were gonna add our firms to it, how the firms should be giving us their data. Fast forward, to creating data pipelines and reports and then automation and then finally dashboards. But that was a six year process. So similar to you, you know, after six years I knocked on the door and said, hey, I got those reports you asked for. <laughs> so it, it was a long time coming, but that's how far and how slow, you know, these things take a lot of time. And I think someone said today, 90% of the time is data cleanup and data formation and then you get to do the cool stuff. So since then, um, we have gotten a lot more support. We've had a lot of wins. My team has grown. We've, we've got a whole, a bunch of engineers that support our team. Um, so we've come a long way. We put a whole bunch of foundational IT infrastructure in place that I think for most legal operations, it's become kind of the first thing you do. So you have an e-billing system, you have a matter management system, you put in e-signatures, automated NDAs, uh, IP management systems, docketing systems, document management, 
you know, discovery. Kind of, so that's the baseline. And a lot of the startups, legal tech startups uh, in the room are actually focusing on trying to solve some of these problems, right. uh, point solutions for these problems. And I guess, I guess I'll, a qu question for Mike. Uh, you mentioned POCs and interoperability, right? And I, th I think a lot of people in the room are going to be interested in hearing um, your thoughts on, first of all, uh, can you talk about uh, maybe an interesting POC that you've done with an external vendor or partner, and and you know how do you deal with interoperability? And uh, you have a, a bunch of solutions by multiple providers, and how do you how do you handle that? Yeah, you know, I think you know historically for for, for many many years you could do a POC with a software service provider pretty easily. They would they provide you the software, you, you'd have it for 30 days to test, and after 30 days were over, they, they'd say, how's it going? i say, I really haven't had time to get to that. Well, you could have another 30 days or 60 days. Those days are over. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's largely now, look, it, it takes some effort to, to try these solutions out. You have to sort of try to figure out, first off, what is it you're trying to solve with the solution? You know, what, you know what's sort of the, uh, you know, what's the use case, right? Uh, how much pro services are involved with trying to implement it just enough so that you can test it effectively and you could run it run it through its courses so there's money to spend uh, and there's time and effort and then you you need lawyers time to really engage because really many many of these tools are focused on the legal professional they're not focused on IT uh, and so you know that is is quite a you know quite a, a, a challenge and I think that um, you know, we need, at least in, in, in law firm profession world, we need to understand that there's an investment to be made there, and we need to try to figure out how to carve out that time uh, that associates might spend on those kinds of efforts, right? Because they have this, you know, hours requirement, call it 1,950 hours. They have to do a certain amount of this and a certain amount of that. Um, and so they're not necessarily rewarded for their contributions around innovation, around knowledge management. So trying to find mechanisms within the firm to help that certainly would help the cause of participation and you'd get much more value out of your proof of, you know, your proof of concept. Um, so, you know, and, you know, I'd say from a success perspective, um, you know, I mentioned due diligence. I, I mean, we're, we're, there's a, I won't mention particular product names, but... Um, you know, we're, we, we obviously do a lot of M&A deals. We have a deal database. We do, we do a lot of, uh, um, you know, document automation and, and that flows into databases, and, and we need products that, that do all the kinds of things that you need out of a, a good due diligence analytics tool and extract clauses and understand indemnities and, and all of those kinds of things that, that we certainly are making pretty good progress on, and, and we're, we're pretty happy about that. Uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, knowledge management. Research is another one to try to really leverage some of the natural query language research tools, uh, predictive kind of search, those kinds of things uh, that, that we really are trying. And we have, we have a, pretty dark, a, a pretty good search tool for work product. We have a pretty good way of aligning um, our expertise with, with that work product so we can kind of get the answer to the solution that, that the GC or whoever is looking for pretty quickly. Um, but there's still plenty of opportunity, but that's probably the best example that I can, can provide is, is around due diligence, yeah. Thank you. And um, Lucy, similar uh, to what um, Mary was talking about, and um, we heard um, from Adam before, the panel before, um, about matter standards and organizing the data and how, how a, lot, a large part of your job was establishing the case of the uh, contract management example, just creating that process. Um, what uh, is the next biggest challenge that you are seeing in, in, your, in your space? So many to pick from, let's see. Um, what's it, what's it? So there's, a, there's an obvious one, um, and, and you know, we just heard Mike mention knowledge management. And I, again, I don't want to talk about knowledge management system because there's a big process problem, right? We, we in-house engage law firms. Law firms provide something. We say thank you. We use it once, and we put it somewhere. That's a problem. No knowledge management system will solve that, no matter how amazing the technology is. So I think that 
If we can solve that, we will solve so many other things along with it. We will solve how we engage firms, we will be more effective, we'll be more efficient, we'll, be, we'll save money. We will be faster in how we deliver our services, our clients will be happier, right? There's a, there's a kind of a chain event, uh, a chain of events that can happen if you do have your knowledge managed in a better way. Again, I don't, I don't think that's a systematic problem. I think there's a ton of different pieces that have to fit in there. Uh, and it's not just about how we procure the services from the law firm and the work product we get there. We have our own internal experts. That's why we have these huge departments and we have privacy experts and we have trademark experts and, and, and they have external experts. We have layers of knowledge and information that we're not doing a good job sharing amongst ourselves in-house. We're not doing a good job sharing it with our own business. We have 100,000 employees that at any moment want to know something about one of our trademarks, which is a very likely realistic question. Um, sharing with them is hard. Sharing amongst ourselves is difficult. Sharing with our law firms also. So there's kind of this circle uh, of knowledge that I think is probably going to be one of our biggest things to tackle, but we're not going to tackle it as a knowledge management problem. We are going to sneak up on it from the way we are engaging law firms, and we will force work product to be organized and delivered in a different way. Uh, we are going to sneak up on it in the way we are tracking um, matter data and matter information and, and extract and learn more from there. We're sneaking up on it from our contract management system, the system we've now been able to implement. So you see, we're, we're going to piece it together without it knowing that we're doing it, and then it'll be a, a beautiful knowledge management um, uh, ecosystem rather than a system. <laughs> that's a that's, that's a, a great point you raise. I've, I've um, had discussions um, with knowledge managers before, and it seems like uh, it, it's a big deal also in the law firm environment, and they're trying to organize their own internal um, documents and, and information. And I, and I, and I wonder if um, you, we will not see a new problem being created if uh, the law firms are developing their own standards, and you are mandating uh, um, something different of, to what they're doing. I don't know, I don't know Mike, uh, if you have uh, any thoughts on that. Uh, how coordinated are you with your clients in creating a... Yeah, Mike. How coordinated are we? How coordinated Mary, are you? Mary, how coordinated do we feel with Mike? <laughs> You know, it, it's a good question. I, by the way, you use the word sharing, which, which uh, in, in law firms in, in the in the partner land is a difficult concept, to be honest with you. Um, and and I think it, it it does lead to inefficiencies, no doubt about it. And and I think that I'm 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 actually happy having having uh, spent some time with Mary and Lucy and understand their their challenges. To to hear uh, that you know they are uh, you know not only putting pressure on. Uh, uh, you know, firms like Wilson Sonsini, but really asking for some cooperation and, and asking for what I think is a partnership. Uh, and, and, you know, I think partnering is, is a theme. Uh, I actually have heard it a couple times in the, during the conference here, but it's a real opportunity uh, for all of us to sort of understand that we're part of an ecosystem. And, uh, you know, I have a role as a CIO in a firm sitting at the cross-section of a lot of what happens in the firm to do my sort of duty, civic duty within the firm to help with efficiencies and, and try to recognize where there's opportunities to leverage innovation. Um, but in a broader sense, I think, you know, you know law firms and, and lawyers, which, which is built so much on networking, you know, members network with you know, Google, uh, you know, executives, and, and uh, you know, then, you know, Lucy has said, and, and Mary get to do their GC thing and, and their law practice operations thing. But, you know, it, it's, it's largely uh, an, a, a huge, huge opportunity to do some partnering and sharing, and I'd love to see that happen and love to be part of that, at least in, in any way that I can. But I think that's, that's certainly something that I would, uh, would think we all uh, should be interested in. So, Mary, what? How do you see organizations like Clock, for instance, playing a playing a role in in creating these standards across the industry that would simplify some of these challenges that everyone seems to be facing? Yeah. So, for those of you that are not familiar with Clock, it's C L O C. It stands for the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium, and it's the largest group of uh, legal operations professionals, and it's growing really rapidly. It's only been around a year, and it's like 600 members now. Um, I'm on the leadership team of this group. I'm very passionate about this group because I think what they're doing or what we're doing is very, very different. Um, having come from working at a law firm and now being in-house and working with a lot of technology providers, in my job I get really frustrated and working with them I see as a technology provider your job is very difficult because it's, easy to, it's easier to have something out of the box that works for everyone. 
but everyone's got their special little snowflake that my company's different, we do things this way and you do things that way, and the industry and the innovation is not gonna progress as quickly as it can if we're not talking to each other and saying let's all do this the same way, because there's no reason for us to do it differently, it's just that we all did it in our own silos, I created my way, Lucy created her way, well, clock came about and we started talking to each other. And we got into a room and within five minutes, like, how do you do it? Well, I'm 90% I'm the same. That 10% difference causes a world of pain for all of us, the law mm -hmm. firms, the technology providers, us in-house. So why don't we get together and start creating some of those standards that are best practice for the whole industry? Um, Clock has created these things called initiatives, where there are working groups of folks from in-house, plus legal service providers, plus law firms, plus technology providers, plus law schools, all these different types of people are coming together around a central issue and saying, can we create a best practice and put it out there and get everyone to adopt it and make it something we all use? So, you know, one example, the first thing we did was we looked at billing guidelines. And again, for the poor firms, what a pain in the butt to like have to adopt each bill to every single client. Well, wouldn't it be great if we all had it sort of the same? Um, I was in another meeting with a bunch of uh, Silicon Valley legal ops folks and we were talking about fixed fees for patent work. We all do it with all our firms, and our firms can't get our, our fixed fees quite right, and they're putting things in the wrong bucket because, oh, that was my other client that had this here, and we have it here. Well, is there any reason why we don't just all adjust? No, let's all do it. And so I'm leading an initiative to do that, and we're working with firms and technology providers. Again, so we're trying to do a lot of this and push the industry to, to move faster because I think once we can all agree on the same way of doing things, the speed of it will accelerate a lot faster. So it's, it seems to me from what, from what I'm hearing and what we've heard throughout the day that a lot of the opportunities for, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, raising the question here on behalf of the legal tech providers and, and people in, in the room um, around finding uh, a standard or, or, or a way to unify the industry in order to achieve the scale that sometimes is not available. Uh, it seems to be that um, we go back to... Uh, uh, some of Jim Sand Sandman's points on why technology, legal technology, hasn't been adapted, uh, adopted fast enough. I think a, a, lot, a lot of the issues have to do with uh, scalability and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all the differences and all the complexities. That's right. um, so I guess I guess the um, the question I'll, I'll ask you, Mike, on this: um, How um, you know when, when, when you get when, when you get a legal tech uh, emerging legal tech player uh, knocking on, on your door uh, asking you to try something out? How how do you make a decision as to whether to implement it, trial it, or even purchase the, the, the product? Yeah, I, I mean, I mentioned the idea that I mean, certainly if you're a CIO in a, in a large law firm, you need to have a roadmap, and you need to have, you know, socialize that roadmap with your firm. Um, and, and by the way, being social as a CIO in a law firm is a really good thing and, and, and something I highly uh, would advise any CIO, which is really to have a lot of outreach and, and get engaged with, with the stakeholders. Um, but, you know, so f from that perspective, um, you know, I, I think that standards are really, really important. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of scalability, uh, really, really important. Uh, and so, it, you know, how is it going to fit? Um, and what is it that you're going to try to deliver? How are you going to deliver it? Um, is it a cloud-based service? You know, do we need to talk about... Um, about that. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm very cloud forward, forward and I don't think, uh, I think the days are over that uh, we as CIOs of law firms should be, you know, shaking in our boots over leveraging the cloud. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, there's so much out there to leverage. Um, and, and, you know, I, it, there's, there's a, certainly a level of transparency that I get around um, protecting client data that we have to have if we're going to adopt cloud services. Don't get me wrong. But that's not a hard thing to do. If you're willing to say, look, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, you do it through your engagement letters and, and your outside counsel guidelines and all those things, and you kind of come up with a, a very transparent way of saying, look, this is how we're going to operate, um, it, 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 you know, it, it allows for a much more efficient workforce if you think about how we all work today, which is largely on mobile platforms, we're traveling all the time. I can guarantee you most everybody here today that's been here that's trying to keep up with their day job has been looking at their phone and trying to kind of keep up. So, you know, cloud services lend themselves very well to that space. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, the, that's one of the opportunities. Um, but, you know, again, uh, I want a partner. 
I want to partner with people that could help. Uh, you know, certainly try to understand my world. I love to understand. You know, I understand sort of how what you're doing. By the way, don't start out the conversation if you're if you're a vendor to say, you know, I'm not really here to sell you anything. I just want you to look at the, you know, yes, you are. Of course, you are. That's why you that's why you developed the software and that's why you developed the solution. And you do want to sell things. I mean, sure, there's opportunities to get input. And, 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 you know, I have plenty of venture firms who want to talk to me about how the space is evolving. Um, but I, I do think it really, if you step back, governance and strategy, all those things are still very, very important roadmap. Make sure what it is that, we're, that, that you're going to look at is going to fit and, and tell me how you're going to help the problems that I'm trying to solve. Uh, but for me, I need to understand what the problems are that the firm has in the first place. Um, and I think more and more CIOs are getting you know, sort of out of that sort of operational CTO, you know, plumbing back office role and much more engaged in how we're going to really, truly improve the business. Uh, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm one of those people that just wants to work in an ecosystem and work together with everyone. Thanks, Mike. And, and Lucy, similar, similar question. I think, I think uh, and by the way, if anyone has any questions, remember, feel free to ask them at any time. Just uh, go to the mics. But um, what, what are some of the... the the, the, I would say cooler technologies that you've used or came, come across um, in, in, in your day job? So rather getting into the n naming of names, I think you mean concepts, right? right what have been right. the most useful? I, I, um, you, yes. can, you can name names so, if you want. But... First of all, um, I, I need to just you know echo, I think, that cloud, right, is uh, we, we shouldn't be on this panel if we can't talk about cloud and we can't kind of urge everybody to embrace it. It is time. I'm kind of sick of having the same conversation over and over again uh, with law firms who are just concerned. I mean, that is the lawyer's dagger. That is the nail in the coffin in every business meeting and every email. I have some concerns. It stops everything. And it's the most powerful little word that for some reason, until I came in-house, I didn't know I had this power. I learned it quickly. But now I kind of jump at every time I see it. I mean, there's it, you know, having the conversation, okay, what are the real concerns, and going through it and trying to calm people down. It, it is just time to move in the cloud. You can't be efficient without it. You can't compute the kind of data that we're going to be all expecting firms to compute without being in the cloud. It, it's super simple. Um, you can't be as accessible and available as we need you to be if, if you're not in the cloud. So it, it's kind of time, and that is one of the best kind of topics, I think, for clock as, as an organization, or whether it's ACC legal ops, or whether it's, you know, in the ABA, who, whatever all of these industry groups are that come together, I think we all need to band together and where we do have good partnerships and good relationships with our firms is show those examples and demonstrate that, that yes, it's, it's time to move in the cloud. Um, so, so first and foremost, we're looking at, you know, at SaaS-based solutions. I mean, on-prem days are, are kind of over for us. So we are, that's the first thing we're looking for. In terms of where I see the most success are those solutions that, A, understand my business goals, the goals of the business I'm running, uh, and those who have had input from attorneys. There was nothing more frustrating than having somebody sell me a system and tell me, well, no, you can't do that. Actually, I can and I do. What do you mean? Well, no, our system doesn't allow it. No, something as simple as kind of have a, a, a contract expiration date or, or start date go beyond the expiration date of the master. It was, some, it was some, something that their tool didn't allow. I said, I do that all the time. Let me teach you how contracting works. And this was with a industry best-in-class solution provider in, in the contract, contracting space. That's extremely frustrating. So if I see the conversations, and those are the sellers out there that are coming in, not trying to sell you anything, but just trying to show you, guess what? They're showing you something that doesn't work. So the, the most, the, the most uh, useful experiences I've had are those that come in and they have a subject matter understanding of what they're selling. Because technologists are brilliant and amazing and forward thinking. The best technologists are partnering with a subject matter expert. So whether you're trying to design a new e-building solution or you're designing a contract management system or record, whatever it is you're, you're designing, please be sure to consult with those who know how that business actually works. So where we've had success uh, is that, where, where they know the business and they understand it. Uh, where we've had success is also when we'd have to do very little or, or no configuration, right? You have, to, you have to customize, of course. I mean, not 
so, sorry, you want to configure, not customize. Um, we, we want to be able to take something off the shelf, do what's within the parameters that they've defined, and really not build stuff on it. Yes, we're the shoemaker, as is Mary, we can build our own shoes, but you know what? There is a huge cost for us to maintain those shoes. Those aren't the sexiest, coolest shoes we're pushing off the line because we're <laughs> illegal, right? So we, we've learned over time that we need to buy stuff that is kind of ready for use. So again, Understanding what the business needs is going to be your best success because those technology solutions that come in and you get us to buy, that's great. That's a win. Guess what? 18 months from now, we're moving off your system. Every conversation we have in clock, every conversation is, what are you on now? What are you moving to? Every single one I've been on right, for the last year or so. So please understand our business, and that's going to be the best way to succeed, and that's partnering. I think that's what you're saying. Thanks so much. And I'm going to ask one quick question to Mary, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, take take some questions. But Mary, how how hard how how empowered are you in in, uh, um, in your role to to make purchasing decisions? And how, you know because because a lot of the you know, conversations I've had, or even when I was in the legal department, uh, I mean we're subject to what the uh, CTO uh, guidelines, um, and we have all these procurement processes, and we can't really even if we like something, we can't really make that call. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, um, it usually is a result, us going out to look for a technology that we want to implement is usually a result of some larger process improvement project or some, something where we're looking for something that we can put in to get better quality, cost, speed, whatever it is. Um, so at that point, we want to demonstrate ROI, and that's kind of the end game. So can we put this in? Can it make things better? Can it make things faster? Can it make things cheaper? And can, can we put it in quickly? Um, so if we can prove that it's going to give us a return on our in our investment, then then it makes it much easier for me, for me to sell that solution. We work really closely with our IT partners. There is a budget, um, but again, if there's a project that we want to resolve something and we can kind of prove that putting an investment in is going to give us returns on in the long run, that's that's much easier to sell than let's just put some money out there and cross our fingers. Thanks. All right. So first question. Thanks very much. I'm uh, Ben Hancock. I'm a legal journalist with The Recorder here in San Francisco. I had a question for, uh, for Mr. Lucas first. I mean, uh, there's been some discussion today about how law firms can use their own proprietary data. I'd be interested in if you can talk a little bit about what Wilson is doing to try and harvest that and how you present that to business as an advantage or an edge. And then from the business perspective, uh, does that give them an edge? What kind of data or, or uses of their internal data are really attractive uh, from your business perspective. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so absolutely, I mean, first thing I'd say is we have a pretty robust search platform to find data generally to match up, and I mentioned this around expertise and, and around work product. That's been very, very helpful. I think data that sits in the finance system, data that sits in, in time slips, narratives, all those, that kind of data is, is very, very valuable. Um, we're trying to, to, to provide profitability and dashboard kind of data to our members, the partners in the firm, uh, through different tools as well. Um, and, and we're trying to do this in a, in a, in a sort of persona, context-based kind of way, which says, look, can we give you sort of a tool, call it the intranet, where you know, you're getting this information that is, um, you know, is contextual to you, right? Persona-based, it understands your role, it understands what you do, and you see that data, and you have a great search mechanism to find the data that you're looking for. Um, and so we've got, you know, a number of different kinds of tools that we've uh, uh, applied to that, um, that some of them very legal-focused and some of them sort of out of the box. Can I add one piece of data that I think is super, so there's the obvious data of spend related and, you know, to time and billing information, but what I think is the most useful data that is not, I don't think, captured yet well or certainly not in a consumable format for us is information about our own business that firms acquire over time. So in my case, again, if I go back to a transactional practice, lots and lots of contracts. Pick your type, it doesn't matter. But a firm that does lots and lots of contracts for an in-house department over the course of years, they're embedded, they're trusted, that's why we keep going back for them, they know our contracts better than we do. Newsflash, they know our contracts better than we do. That's a problem. The first firm to raise their hand and say, let me teach you something. I might end up doing less of these for you, but I'm going to teach you that Section 6 sucks and you really need to rewrite it because I've been spending millions of your dollars renegotiating the same section for a decade. 
That's a problem. So the most valuable partnership that you can build is that trust with the firm that's going to not just educate you, but take a little bit out of their own pocket as a result of it and, and gain that trust to get more, more work from you down the road. That, so that kind of data is not what you think of as traditional, kind of computational data, but it is so valuable for us to learn our business because over the years, the more we outsource, the more firms know than we do in some cases. Thank you. Uh, next question. Hi, thanks. My name's Kian. I'm not going to mention my company because we're not mentioning companies. <laughs> um, as a small company, when we're dealing with enterprise, we could get eaten alive, crushed by your processes, by your standard terms and conditions, which aren't even remotely commensurate with the nature of services that we deliver. So if you're looking to be cutting edge and innovative and you want to be engaging with smaller companies, what type of initiatives are you undertaking to be able to break down some of those barriers to truly and allow you to try to test some of the smaller companies' technologies out there? Uh, well, so I mean, I'll start. So you've made a presumption. You've made a presumption that we want to work with a lot of smaller companies. We want to work with innovative companies. Okay, I'm not going to get into the size matters or doesn't matter debate. We want to work with innovation, but we need to be smart and safe. So you're probably going to hear, we're the, so I'm an attorney uh, here, and I'm one of the most comfortable taking risk. I'm still not going to put in jeopardy our reputation. I'm still not going to put in jeopardy the data and the personal information that we collect as a service provider to billions of people, right? So we have to balance. Some of the process is exhausting. I understand that some of it is annoying. We do need to cut through that, and I always want that, that feedback. And that is where we do chip away. But there, is, there has to be a smart balance, and we look for companies externally to also to understand what is unnecessary process, provide us that feedback, but what really is necessary, and what part of those standard terms and conditions are showstoppers for, for a reason. So, so it's a balance. Yeah, I, I'll agree with that. I'm actually not a lawyer, so that's why I can't really answer anything about our terms and conditions, but our security process, I have heard and I know, is pretty rigorous, and I agree there's nothing we can do about that. That's, that's really important. So just as a quick follow-up, if you are going to try to experiment with rockets, you can certainly set up a very safe area in your organization far Which away we, yep. to try out a rocket so that do. doesn't have an implication across And we have yet. a process for pilots and POCs, and we have a, a place to try to launch a few rockets safely. The, 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 the hardest part is then if we really love that rocket, and then they can't pass our security requirements, we've wasted a ton of time and money. So again, it's the balance of, wow, how badly do I want to test this? Is this thing really as amazing as that demo looked? And that goes, that goes back to, again, what are you trying to show me? What do you know about my business? How sexy is that demo? And then I'm going to have an explosion in the backyard. And, so. and on the small company piece, if it is a rocket and we love it and we want to launch it, you better be ready to launch it big. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Another question. Hi, uh, my name is Nick Pullman. I'm a current student at USC. Um, and so this might be a little bit kind of a different tangent, but it's kind of in line with companies pushing for changes, uh, coupled with the growth of in-house in teams. Do you guys still see um, law firms as kind of the only training ground for new lawyers, or with the growth of these resources, do you think that we can start moving some of these things in-house, kind of not requiring the five-year track at a law firm and then pulling them out? Yeah, I mean, it's something we're talking about a lot in the industry these days, and it's becoming um, less and less of a requirement as you talk to other in-house counsel or other legal departments that it's a requirement to start a law firm. Um, we're, we're hearing a lot about some of the stuff that they get trained on at law firms. They come in-house, and we have to immediately untrain them. Um, you know, that's not always the case, but there, that, yeah. there's certain, certainly some of that. I think where you're going to see the biggest changes are in the professions that we're hiring, the functions that we're filling with fresh, fresh law school graduates. So if you're talking about hiring into a typical trend, you know, attorney role, probably we're still going to be looking at a couple of years of experience in order to do your traditional legal work. That will continue for another, you know, there's still time that needs to happen in evolution. But departments like ours, and I'm sure Mary's as well, are hiring data scientists, business analysts, program managers, process project manager. I mean, you name it. And we have a very diverse group now that have come together. So what is the perfect combination is a fresh law student that's going to come out, can issue spot, has learned from some of the amazing schools that we did hear about. That's what I've been taking notes on, is what some of the law schools are doing today, which is amazing, Stanford, of course, included. right? And they're coming out with new skills. And it's a combination of that. 
Those are some of the most interesting, I think, paths that law students can start to consider and that we're here to help law schools educate students on. Absolutely. Thank you. So Lucy, that's an ex uh, excellent segue, actually. I'm going to ask the last question here because we're running um, on, about on time. But um, I mean, you, you were here all day. Uh, you heard all the presentations, and a lot of them were really interesting. As people that are responsible for creating the infrastructure of sorts and processes and supporting the, the legal work that happens in, in your organizations, what do you think from what you heard today uh, is the most relevant or the most innovative or more, most actionable um, sort of proposals or, or topics that you heard? That's a good one. I, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll jump in just because where we, where we left off. I, I'm, I was really excited about in the last presentation we heard that the list of law schools used to be, you know, 10-ish I think was the number and now that list of law schools that are doing creative things and teaching innovative things is, is basically doubling. I think because if you think about the whole ecosystem of what we represent, right, in-house, we're the big consumers, we're buying from firms, firms also have to deliver to, to, to you know, and access to justice to all kinds of, uh, of consumers, but guess where it all starts is the law school. I mean, that's the future of, our, of what, what we define as an attorney. I think that has to look different, and it's starting to look different, so that's been super, uh, super welcoming to me, and it gave, gave me some great ideas that even... I can take back as an influencer with some of the law schools that we try to recruit from and, and we try to, you know, to, to hire students from. So that, that, was, that was inspiring. Thanks. How about, how about you, uh, Mary? Uh, so I, I admittedly missed a couple of the, um, the panels because I had to take some calls, but I thought the whole day was interesting. We, we internally are, are trying to experiment. We're trying to push the envelope on legal technology and innovation in-house, so we are using a bunch of um, AI, so that panel I thought was great. We're using expert systems. Um, we're, we're trying to do a lot of that stuff. I admit that some of that conversation went over my head. You guys are way smarter than me, but the practical uses of it are here today. Um, I think a lot of the AI talks conjure these 20 year from now thoughts and robot lawyers, but a lot of it is, is already here and it is in practice. Um, and then I thought the bots conversation was fascinating and I was actually literally, literally sitting with my team over there going, how do we get we should have some bots in house. We should use bots for knowledge management. So <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was cool. I was going to add to that. The chatbots thing, I think, is, is in, 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 from an in-house perspective. Uh, I think where it gets interesting is when you start to use that, uh, you know, outside of, of the firm. And, and, you know, we're really kind of, I, I will say, quite risk averse around lawyers um, using chat systems generally to give legal advice. And, and it just it, in terms of just discoverability and the risk that that poses, you know, as, as you know, an assistant GC, I'm sure you know, you're, you're trying to kind of, <laughs> you've got enough risk to deal with and you're trying to limit that. But that is really in some ways, and I'm, you know, that's the opportunity. If we can get those kinds of collaborative kinds of mechanisms, it really opens things up a lot. It's just there's, there's still a lot of concern around how that information is recorded, um, and you know, in, in, when things don't go, you know, go well, uh, how, where's all that information, and, and where's it going to end up? See, and, they trained you to say concern. <laughs> yeah. See, I, it, we, we do it. I, we do it all. It, it, work it, it happens. <laughs> yeah. It happens. Well, excellent. I mean, one just uh, one thing I want to mention um, before we close here, uh, and you and you mentioned this, Mike, uh, right before the the panel. Um, you know, when, when, when we asked for a show of hands, we didn't get that many CIOs. There's not that many legal operations people, and yet you represent a very important part of the ecosystem. Um, you are creating processes, infrastructure. A lot of the conversations that we heard about today are, were about uh, changing the legal practice, uh, and uh, which implies changing legal processes, uh, trying alternative legal service providers, trying to create matter standards. Uh, attorneys are not doing these things. Uh, it's really these folks um, sort of creating that infrastructure. And I think, um, at least personally, one thing I would love to see um, in future conferences, as we've seen uh, the community grow and evolve, uh, include regulators and others beyond sort of the legal tech providers um, to have more customers. Uh, these, are, these are the people that are actually going to be implementing a lot of the technologies that are coming out of these conferences. So uh, with that, uh, hopefully, uh, we answered some of the questions folks here had. Uh, but um, please uh, um, let's thank our panel. Mm -hmm.